Hello and welcome to India's Key, podcast by the Center for Policy Research. I am Sushant Singh, Senior Fellow at CPR. You are listening to our special series titled Spotlight South Asia that brings leading experts from India's neighborhood to understand the events in these countries whether political, economic or social, but from a domestic perspective. The country featured today is Bangladesh, and my guest is Akhtar Mahmood. Akhtar Mahmood is an economist who was lead private sector specialist in the World Bank Group, where he worked on private sector development for three decades. In the 1990s, he worked extensively in the transitional economies of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe on state-owned enterprise reforms and privatization. From 2007 to 2010, while based in Bangladesh, he designed and initiated implementation of the World Bank Group's largest single country investment climate program. He has taught economics at the University of Dhaka and was a visiting fellow at Yale University, where his work was published as the political economy of development change. He was a member of the UNDP team that produced the first human development report. He is also the co-author of Privilege Resistant of Policy Making in the Middle East and North Africa, published by the World Bank. Akhtar, welcome to Spotlight South Asia. Thank you very much for having me. Akhtar, to begin with, many South Asian countries uh, have reported economic distress in recent months and are facing a great crisis. You know, I'm, I'm referring to Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Uh, Bangladesh, in some ways, has been an exception and a star performer uh, with, with very high economic growth in the region in the last few years. But how is the current economic situation in Bangladesh? How are the fundamentals holding up? Okay. Uh, well, firstly, uh, obviously, countries go through economic challenges. We know about business cycles, terms of trade cycles. So it's not, not, not a great surprise that there are some challenges that we are going through, although both at home and abroad, partly because of the uh, Sri Lanka crisis, uh, the brewing crisis in Pakistan, and some recent um, stress on our balance of payments and also the government's decision to approach the, uh, the International Monetary Fund for a loan package has created this perception that perhaps Bangladesh is also heading towards a crisis. And I think that's, that's very misplaced. Uh, if you look at the traditional um, indicators of external debt, uh, distress or sustainability. Uh, there are two indicators, as you know. One is the solvency indicator, the other is the liquidity. So the external debt by GDP ratio, and then you have the uh, external debt uh, repayment obligations divided by the export earnings. And on both these indicators, Bangladesh is uh, way below the threshold, which is considered to be uh, risky or challenging. So there's a lot of headroom. And when the IMF and the World Bank did their joint debt sustainability assessment in uh, February of this year, it was published, I think, in March or April, uh, they also did a number of stress tests. So they made pro projections for the future, assuming all kinds of scenarios, including very pessimistic scenarios uh, on export growth, GDP growth, etc. And even under those um, pessimistic scenarios, and even acknowledging the fact that our debt obligations, payment obligations are going to go, go up a bit in the next few years because of some recent loans, the, the results still suggested that the debt sustainability situation is quite good. So let me clarify that first. Now let's come to the balance of payment situation. Now recently, Bangladesh's foreign exchange reserves went below 40 billion. Uh, and that created a bit of uh, concern in the, in the country. Uh, and that seemed to be more a psychological barrier because if you look at the long-term trend, and I did that recently, let's say the last 20 years or so, uh, the, there has been a steadily rising trend of foreign exchange reserves. So obviously in some years it will go above trend, in some years below trend. So in fiscal 21, it went significantly above trend because exports grew, remittances grew, but imports did not grow that much. The opposite happened in the last fiscal year, and so results went down. So when I look at the long-term trend, uh, I'm not that concerned. Uh, our exports are still uh, doing quite well, despite all the uh, contraction in demand and all of that. So that's, that's the current situation. Now, you asked me about the fundamentals. And in answering that question, I'd like to 
mention one thing because that's not really acknowledged both in the country and certainly not abroad, which is the fact that the economy of Bangladesh is actually in some ways quite organic and resilient. We all talk about the dependence on garment export, but we do have a very vibrant manufacturing sector which is which targets the domestic market and that's much more diversified than our export basket so that's one thing the other thing which is not really acknowledged is the significant transformation that has happened in the rural economy it started with the hyb rice the green revolution in the 70s then there was diversification into non-rice crops then there was diversification into non-crop agriculture poultry fisheries livestock and in parallel, there was a development of the rural non-farm sector, helped, of course, by rising agricultural incomes, remittances going into the rural area. So a lot of synergies were happening there. And as a result of that, we now have a very vibrant rural economy. And, you know, agriculture can be quite resilient against a number of things. We saw that during COVID and agriculture in Bangladesh is not affected by external demand conditions. It's, it's affected by certain import prices. So in that sense, the economy is actually quite resilient. So that's a good thing about the fundamentals. And there's a certain dynamism in the economy. There's also has been an unleashing of the entrepreneurial talent of Bengalis. And that's not only confined to garments or large businesses. It starts from the small farmers and goes across the board. And that I think is a major asset for a country which doesn't have any other significant assets like natural resources. But there are some fundamental weaknesses as well. And most of these are governance related. So, for example, in the banking sector, the, the proportion of non-performing loans is very high and going up. That's a big problem. There are concerns about the efficiency of public expenditures. Uh, we have a lot of cost overruns in projects. Uh, there are allegations of corruption. And the third factor which I like to mention and, and which could be one of the biggest threats to Bangladesh's development going forward is a rising cronyism. Now, as you know, when an economy develops, certain uh, groups of businesses become more powerful and it, they could be powerful because they are competitive to start with or they get privileges. But once they become powerful, they acquire political power as well. And then they start influencing policy. And that's when policies can become distorted. So I think for Bangladesh, a problem is the rising cronyism. That is something that needs to be checked, along with the more traditional problems of indiscipline in the banking sector and corruption. These are long-standing problems, and these are where some of the fundamental weaknesses are. So going forward, it will be a tussle between this entrepreneurial spirit that I mentioned and, and the cronyism and poor governance. And we'll have to wait and see who wins in that tussle. Akhtar, is the economy too dependent on textiles and garment manufacturing and export? Or has Bangladesh reached a state, stage where it needs to find a path into the next stage of economic growth and development? And is there such a path available to Dhaka? Right. So, so, so you're right. As I said, the economy is not as dependent on garments as exports is. So our exports, 80% or more, comes from garments. Uh, but garments are still important for the economy. I'm not going to uh, discount the importance of it. But let's come on the come to the question of export diversification. And that is indeed one of the big agenda items for Bangladesh now. Now, diversification has two dimensions. First, even within garments, there is a lot of scope for diversification. Within garments, there are five broad product groups like trousers, uh, shirts, uh, sweaters, etc., which constitute more than 75% of our garments export. Uh, but garments, as you know, consists of thousands of products. And Bangladesh does export a little bit of many products, but that's where there's a scope to increase the proportion of uh, garment items which are relatively less important in the basket now. So diversification within garments uh, is also a possibility. And because Bangladesh has a track record of making and delivering garment products, uh, they have a competitive advantage in that. So why not take advantage and diversify within garments? There's also diversification options in the material that is used. So our garments are cotton-based. There is a slow movement now towards uh, man-made fibers. And I think that's also something important. 
So I wanted to mention that, that there's scope for diversification within garments, but also beyond garments. Now, Bangladesh has started making some breakthrough in more sophisticated products like electronics. That's happening within uh, a protective uh, trade um, uh, regime. I think uh, what we need to do is to increase the efficiency in these kinds of industries. And that's where foreign investment is going to be important. You know, garments in Bangladesh developed without much foreign investment, although the initial impetus came through a partnership with Dayu. But if foreign investment comes in in a big way, uh, especially in those kinds of sectors, which can help us make a breakthrough in the global value chains, I think that's going to be a very important part of our agenda. So there's a foreign investment agenda linked with a diversification agenda. And I think we still have a lot more work to do in that area. Akta, how would you characterize Bangladesh's economic ties with China and India? Uh, how would someone like you see it from inside Bangladesh, contrary to what the Western observers or, let's say, Indian observers try to say about this relationship? Okay, uh, thanks for asking that, because, uh, as you know, in, in many issues, uh, geopolitics comes in and that clouds our thinking and our analysis. So let's look beyond that. So for us in Bangladesh, the relationship is primarily economic, and at this stage, a large part of that is around infrastructure. So as you know, Bangladesh's per capita income may not be that great, but the total size of the economy is very significant. We are amongst the top 40 economists. And if you look at purchasing power parity calculations, we're actually in the top 30. That's a very large economy. And such a large economy demands a lot of infrastructure. Our infrastructure endowments are far less compared to what we need to serve this large and growing economy. So infrastructure needs are enormous. And, and one of the major sources of our infrastructure financing is China. So that's really at the core of our economic relations with China. Going forward, I see another dimension in our relations with China, and that is linked to what I just said about diversification of exports. Now, as you know, foreign investment uh, usually has three motives. One is what we call natural resource seeking FDI. And uh, it could be things like nat uh, natural gas exploration, petroleum, et cetera. Then you have the market seeking. So when you have a huge market like Bangladesh, it's natural that a lot of the foreign investment coming in, whether from China, India, or other countries, would be targeting the domestic market. And that's fine. I mean, we need investment there. I mean, the entire telecoms industry in Bangladesh uh, ha has been built on the basis of foreign investment. And that telecom industry has been very, very useful for us. So that's, that's important. But going forward, what we also need is FDI into what is called efficiency-seeking FDI, which is they see Bangladesh as an efficient production base for exporting. So whether it's electronics, whether it's garments, whether it's something else, foreign investment which comes to leverage the efficiency that Bangladesh may have, the comparative advantage that Bangladesh may have, and help Bangladesh get a foothold in various global value chains. So going forward, I would see more and more, I would like to see more and more Chinese FDI coming in to help us make that uh, entry into global value chains. So it's primarily economic. Now, if we want to now come to India, uh, I'm sure that all the talk that's going on, and as you know, our prime minister was in India recently about uh, investment. Uh, again, I would not be surprised if a lot of the Indian investment uh, is of the market-seeking type coming to um, uh, serve the Bangladeshi market. But we would very much like to see FDI, which helps Bangladesh make a bigger entry into the um, uh, global market. So the efficiency-seeking investment from India, I guess, would also be very welcome. Akta, uh, do economic ties, as you just pointed out, really dominate the overall relationship with China, unlike with India? Uh, or, and what does that really mean? Is it a balancing act that Dhaka is continuously playing between Beijing and New Delhi? How, because this is a question which, uh, which is asked regularly in India. What is Dhaka trying to do vis-a-vis -vis Be Beijing and New Delhi? How would uh, you characterize uh, that, that uh, you know, the, the relationships or the way uh, Dhaka weighs those two relationships? 
Okay, well, as you know, my, my discipline is in economics, and within that, it has largely been around private sector development. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim knowledge of uh, international relations or geopolitics, and uh, uh, others who study these would be able to give you a better answer. From my vantage point, I do see the economic relations being the dominant relationship at, at this stage. And I did mention the reasons, the reason why we need those kind of investments. And, and, and if you think about those investments, both on the infrastructure side and foreign investment helping Bangladesh to diversify its economy, uh, I think the, the space is very, very large on, on both dimensions. And I think China, even if, if our relations with China double in the next few years by some metric, it will still be able to satisfy only a fraction of the needs. So there's a lot of scope for other countries and especially for India to come into the space. And that's why I wish that these discussions of economic relations are not too distorted, not too clouded by geopolitical considerations. Now, I'm, I'm not a naive person. I do understand that uh, the, the world is not just about economics. There are many other factors there. But I think that the, the core driver in Bangladesh, I still think is the economic driver. And that's the agent of this particular government and for very good reasons. And I think there's a lot of scope there for various countries to come and be partners with us. So when you hear the government saying, our motto is um, friendship towards all, it sounds like a cliche and it might sound very naive in this complex world. But at one level, actually, if you focus on economics, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Well, moving on a bit after the pandemic has taken a ma major toll on social indicators globally, and particularly in India as well. How has Bangladesh coped with the challenge posed by the pandemic, say, in sectors like public education, public health, uh, and, and other social uh, sectors? Yeah, let me, let me maybe in the interest of time, just focus on one of those aspects, uh, the public education. But let me say a bit about the social protection thing, because I think the government did pay a lot of attention to social protection. And yes, there have been inefficiencies, there have been some leakages, but overall, I think the social protection schemes uh, ha have worked reasonably well. Now, that hasn't prevented a lot of people from falling back into poverty or still struggling, all that's happening. But, you know, traditionally, the governments in Bangladesh had always been sensitive about uh, the needs of the poor people. We can come back to that theme later, but that's there. Now, the education, yes. In education, there has been actually a number of surveys done which have shown that, shown quite starkly the disruptions caused by uh, the pandemic on education. So there have been surveys which showed that uh, children are not spending as much time on studies as they used to do before the, the focus on uh, studies uh, have gone down. I saw a survey result which said before the pandemic, just about 1% complained that they can't focus on studies. After the pandemic, about 14 to 15% are complaining they can't focus on, on studies. Um, uh, many uh, children, especially the girls, have been taken away into uh, household chores. Uh, there's some evidence that child marriage is also increasing. Uh, as a result of pandemic, which means these people may even uh, not come back to school. And also because of the general uh, economic challenges, many households may find it difficult to send their children back to school. So this is, these are the problems which are happening or the risks which are there on the horizon. Now, what has the government done about it? So one is, of course, remote learning, but remote learning also has some constraints, especially because uh, the equipment that you need at the end, the the children's and computers, uh, access to televisions, etc., limited. So the government, with the help of other agencies like the World Bank, are providing tablets so that you're not so much dependent on, on the internet. So those are being done. Content development is being done. Teachers are being trained. Uh, it's still very challenging to bring in um, uh, remote learning, but these are things that the government is doing. There's a stipend program so that uh, the economically vulnerable families uh, can still afford to put their children back into school, so the dropout rates are minimized. So all these are happening, but that's, that's, that's an important challenge. Also, after we hear a lot about climate change, and particularly from where you are sitting currently, uh, that, that's, a, that's one big topic which 
but uh, which is raised again and again um, by 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 the western countries how badly has bangladesh been affected by climate change and what can be done uh, both by bangladesh by other countries in the neighborhood and globally to mitigate those risks okay i'll actually broaden it a bit because there's a broader environmental concern as well and often that's a flip side of development so the country has developed as you mentioned also at a fairly respectable rate there's a flip side of that and i'll just give one specific example uh, coming back to garments so in garments we had also developed backward linkages which is a textile and that's we all think that's a great development we have gone into backward linkage local value addition has increased all of that but textile is a very water intensive industry unlike garment uh, yeah. so and in bangladesh the use of water has been very inefficient on two counts one is because water is free so these factories they have set up their own uh, tube wells etc and they pump as much water as they would like so i was involved in the project several years ago and a world bank group project where we saw that textile factories are using three times four times more water than they need for, for their production uh, so there was a huge inefficiency and the water tables around the clusters of textile factories are falling at an alarming rate so that's one thing but the effluents which are produced during textile production those effluents are not treated well and the untreated water is then uh, disposed into the water bodies next to these uh, the factory clusters so that's also uh, uh, having an impact on the environment so so one is the impact on the environment uh, of growth itself and that has to be addressed and and that's a big challenge and then that's compounded by of course the climate change effects and i will mention a few so one is in agriculture so the, the with the rising water levels in bay of bengal there's a lot of saline intrusion so especially in the southern districts of bangladesh that's a big problem for agriculture um uh, you also have um uh let's say in the urban areas the workability and the livability is going to decline further as the temperature levels go up in urban areas there is likely to be significant internal migration on top of what we already see and that's going to put further pressure uh on the on the uh, cities uh, uh, of bangladesh so all around whether it's in industry or whether it's in um, agriculture whether it's in rural areas whether it's in the urban areas there are all kinds of uh, climate change effects that we are observing now bangladesh has already started a number of mitigation steps uh, so for example um, uh, in agriculture the researchers are coming up with varieties of crops which are resistant which can grow despite salinity which can grow despite water levels being high uh, there's a lot of emphasis now on renewable energy these are examples of uh, mitigation or adaptation measures that the bangladesh government is taking now there's another aspect where other countries including india can help out uh, you know the the frequency or intensity of rain during monsoon is likely to go up because of climate change and that can cause more frequent and more damaging floods than we have seen in the past and in bangladesh uh, what happens with the rivers what happens with flood it doesn't originate within bangladesh as you know very well so that's where india has a role to play uh, it has a role to play in terms of sharing information on what's going on in terms of rainfall i've heard scientists in bangladesh complain that often they are not made aware by their counterparts in india of um, uh, climatic conditions rainfall conditions which after a few days are going to affect bangladesh so timely provision of information may give the bangladesh authorities enough time uh, to address possible flash floods or things like that so that's just one example of where there can be collaboration across countries to help bangladesh address um, the challenges of climate change uh, akshay uh, what has been the impact of modern technology on bangladesh society and i ask this because this is one big hot debate going on both in europe and in the us and as well as in a country like india that modern technology has completely changed society completely changed politics completely changed the way economy functions 
and how has Bangladesh society responded to that transformative change? Uh, because in some ways it's a very young country, it's a very conservative place at one level, but it's also a very modern country in, a, in another way. How is it responding to these kind of very transformative changes that technology has brought in? Well, one aspect, of course, is the uh, the spread of digital technology, which on the one hand has had economic impacts, but I guess you're talking also about uh, impacts on the behavior of people, on the sociology, etc. Uh, technology has certainly helped increase connectivity, and uh, and that uh, has um, has had a positive impact in terms of increasing mobility of people, um, increasing the way people do business with each other, the way they exploit various economic opportunities. The entrepreneurial spirit that I mentioned earlier has certainly benefited from the increased use of technology. Uh, the younger generation of Bangladesh have become particularly savvy as elsewhere in using technology to access information, which um, uh, is uh, certainly widening their horizons, uh, giving them all kinds of ideas. And we can see people in Bangladesh, uh, younger people uh, acting on the information that they are acquiring using technology. Uh, one good example is that young Bangladeshis are now more and more interested in business, in startup businesses, for example, not just getting a job as in the past. Uh, I'm sure there's a wider range of impact in their behavior and in their culture, which I'm not completely privy to, partly because I've been living abroad for quite some time. I'm sure there are people who are, who are studying that. Uh, there are also, uh, as elsewhere, some negative implications. Uh, as you know, social media can also help spread all kinds of wrong information, uh, and that can, that can create a, a bit of uh, tension within the country, and that in turn invokes a reaction from the government. So, for example, the government has an act called the Digital Security Act, which has been used also to stifle dissent. But the government's point of view is that because of the spread of digital technology, there are security issues that the country has to be concerned about. Uh, and, and these kind of provisions in the legal framework are a reaction to that. So it's a complex situation. Uh, this is something which I also need to uh, learn more about, but these are some of the changes, both positive and negative, that we can observe uh, because of the uh, spread of technology. Uh, to something more controversial, uh, uh, politics in Bangladesh has been very fractious and polarized, often violent and vindictive. Uh, what can you tell our listeners about the state of democracy in the country? What are the big political challenges that you see coming up in Bangladesh, particularly to democracy? Okay, I will take an expensive definition of democracy, but if you go by the uh, the narrow definition first, the one which people often refer to, which is the way elections are conducted. Uh, this has always been an issue in Bangladesh, uh, and I guess in many developing countries, perhaps even in developed countries, the fairness uh, of the elections, uh, whether they are free and impartial, etc., uh, and, and in recent years, uh, the questions about our electoral process have become uh, even more pronounced. So going forward, I think the next elections would be a very important test of the government's commitment to democracy. It's extremely important that the elections are held in a way which is uh, free and fair in practice, and equally important, it's perceived to be free and fair. But uh, uh, that's about electoral politics. But uh, beyond elections, even the conduct of politics in, in Bangladesh, you are correct. Had, there had always been an element of violence. And in some ways, I think we have to go back into history, go back into the colonial period, because at that time, because of the nature of the state, politics could not be conducted in the way we would like it to be conducted. So there was violence from the state, and that had to be met by violence from the uh, from the civilians as well who were involved in politics. And that continued during the Pakistan era as well, because as you know very well, there was a strong colonial element and, and, and Pakistan had been ruled. I'm talking about the period 47 to 71 uh, for a long period by military establishments. So once again, the politics that had to be carried out 
at that time did have an element of violence and that also carried on in, into Bangladesh. And it's not so easy to come out of that. Uh, so that's different from, although it's not completely unrelated to the way elections are conducted, but that's a part of the DNA of the politics that we have to contend with. But I would like to bring in a couple of other definitions of democracy. So one is beyond elections, to what extent is the government uh, accountable or responsive to the needs of the people. And this is where I feel that governments in Bangladesh, even military governments, have always felt a certain need to respond to the, uh, the demands or the requirements of the vulnerable and the poor sections of the people. Now, this there may be historical reasons for this, a lot of people talk about the famine of 74 and how it has had a profound impact on the way successive governments behave. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier during the pandemic also, we saw a certain degree of responsiveness. So that that's another aspect of democracy, where the governments are responsive to what the general public wants, what their needs are, etc. Accountability, I think Bangladesh should score less on that. The accountability of the government machinery, they is much more that needs to be done. And the final aspect of democracy that I'll mention is economic democracy, where the economic opportunities are being created in a more democratic way. And that's where uh, uh, the things that I was mentioning before, and I just want to add something, that in Bangladesh, successive governments have tried to have a balance between a market economy and the need to create opportunities for the poor. Uh, and that balancing act has been performed reasonably well, not perfectly, of course not, but reasonably well, so that economic opportunities have also been created for the ordinary people in Bangladesh, and they have been quick to grab those opportunities. But as I mentioned, there is rising cronyism in the country, which means that there is a certain degree of monopolization of economic opportunities, which is happening in some sectors, there's a risk it may, may become more pronounced, but I wanted to bring in the issue of economic democracy as well, because when we talk of democracy, we don't always talk of that dimension. After you mentioned Pakistan and the and the 24-year Pakistan rule over erstwhile East Pakistan and now Bangladesh, what you know, many Indians are curious to understand in the last 51 years, what happened that Bangladesh took such a totally different journey from what Pakistan took in terms of economic development, particularly. I'm sure you must have reflected on that at some point in time. Would you like to share that with the listeners? Yes, very much. And thanks for asking. And this is where I would like to uh, go back into history. I think it's very, very important. You know, if we look at the region, which is now Bangladesh, which used to be East Bengal, uh, it was a peasant economy uh, and there were landlords uh, on top of them. Uh, and there was an exploitative relationship between the peasants and the landlords and the money lenders. Uh, so if you look at the political discourse, the intellectual discourse, uh, going back at least 100 years, the dominant theme in this was exploitation of the poor. And different generations of Bangladeshis had grown up, including our political leaders, uh, around this discourse. And out of that came the realization that we have to look after the poor, we have to create opportunities for the poor. So just after independence, the top priority of the country was food security. And I mentioned the, uh, the, um, the HYV rise and the green revolution, which was intimately linked with that. So the emphasis on agriculture, the emphasis on the rural economy, which I mentioned at the outset, is derived from that concern that opportunities have to be created for the poor people. Now, if we start with that position, a lot of other things fall into place. So the emphasis on the rural economy, creating opportunities for the poor people of Bangladesh to go and migrate uh, when they had the opportunity, to create a labor-intensive export industry like garments. You may actually ask why Pakistan, despite having all the advantages, uh, cotton production, textile production, and Bangladesh had, having none of that, it was Bangladesh's government which took off. So again, I think there was this emphasis always that we have to create opportunities for uh, the poor people of Bangladesh. So even the elite, uh, uh, even if they live in a bit of a bubble sometimes, there's one part of their brain which is concerned 
about the poor people. And I think, I think, as I said, everything else is derived from that, that concern. And that, I think, is what made the difference. So one last question, uh, you know, after, to someone looking at today's India from Bangladesh, uh, how does it look like? How does India look from Dhaka? Right. So, so firstly, right now, there is obviously a concern about what is perceived to be a serious decline in the secular principles that India had upheld for a long, long time. Uh, and also, uh, uh, there's a perception that uh, dissent is something which is not being tolerated uh, as much as it used to be in the past in, in India. So that's one concern. The other is, is just because of the presence of India as a very large neighbor. In, as you know very well, we are surrounded on three sides by India. So it's very natural that there will be this big brother syndrome and, and the perception that India may be interfering or intervening uh, in, in affairs of Bangladesh. So I'm talking of perception. Uh, reality may, may not necessarily always conform with perceptions, but perceptions, uh, I think you will agree, Shushan, can be very, very important. Uh, the third view is, of course, of India as a rising economic power. In Bangladesh, we are all very impressed by the strides India made in the IT area. Uh, and we think we have much to learn from that. But also the prospect of India becoming an important economic power, but also a power in other senses. And we are, I think, impressed by the independent position India is taking in, in, in current years uh, in, on the international stage, which I think is also inspiring for us. Uh, I think um, what Bangladeshis would like to see from India and Indians, so one is at the official level, the other would be at the level of citizens, is an understanding of where Bangladeshis come from when they express an opinion on India. So if there is a negative opinion being expressed on any aspect of India, uh, that should not be seen as an unfriendly act, as something against India. And I've seen sometimes comments in social media and elsewhere that Bangladeshis are being ungrateful by making these comments because after all, India had, had a major role in our uh, independence war. Uh, India facilitated that to a significant extent. Uh, so is Bangladesh being ungrateful? I think it's very important to understand where Bangladesh is coming from, uh, particularly given the fact that you have a, such a large neighbor all around us. Uh, there, there could be genuine grounds for concern. And when Bangladesh has expressed that concern, that has to be understood properly instead of having uh, uh, knee-jerk reactions uh, India around that. At the same time, I think Bangladeshis need to understand the nuances in India. Uh, for, for example, the fact that India has a federal structure uh, is something that we may not have fully appreciated initially. And then recently, when we had dealings with West Bengal around uh, water sharing, we came to realize that you know the states have a lot of power uh, uh, within a federal structure. That's one example of the nuances within India that we need to understand. We need to understand that despite the negative trends that I talked about uh, uh, at the start of my comments on India, uh, obviously there are, there are players in India, including your center, who have been playing a very uh, commendable role in making sure that that slide doesn't happen. Similarly, I think in India, there needs to be some understanding of the nuances within Bangladesh and where Bangladeshis are coming from. Akhtar, that's a great point to end this conversation on. Uh, I hope uh, both people in India and Bangladesh and the governments and officials are able to understand each other better, able to engage with each other better. That would be good for the region as well. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Akhtar, and I look forward to uh, hosting you in Delhi. Thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a great pleasure on my side as well. And I agree with you. I think the more and more conversations we have, between Indians and, uh, and Bangladeshis, I think those understanding, the sophisticated understanding that is very important uh, will, will happen. To our listeners, thank you for listening. For more information on our work, follow us on Twitter at CPR underscore India and log on to our website at www.cprindia.org.